Hello and good morning. I'm going to try this again. I am Kenny Polkar, your host of the party. And today is Thursday, February 23rd, 2023. And it is an absolutely another spectacular day here in South Florida. Look at that. The sky could not be bluer. The sun could not be warmer, right? Although today there's a bit of a breeze and you can probably hear that in the background. So maybe it suggests some volatility in turbulent times ahead. So what is it that we need to know? Well, let's start with this. The Fed has spoken. So the question now is, will investors listen or are they going to continue to ignore this message? Stocks churned yesterday and they're attempting to move higher this morning, kind of churning slightly higher, right, as the day, uh, as the morning turns into uh, the opening, right? Oil fell further yesterday as inventories build and the dollar remains strong and that will, you know, be a headwind for oil. Gold and other precious metals are also under pressure because of the strong dollar as well, because you understand that inverse relationship. We probably haven't done it tonight, we're having the marinated pork chops, but this one you got to plan for because you're going to marinate in your fridge overnight. Okay, so again, I'm going to say it one more time. Hello, is anybody home? Is anybody listening? Investors, traders, and algos got little to no confirmation that the Fed has any interest in slowing, stopping, or cutting rates anytime soon. In fact, the FOMC minutes released yesterday at 2 p.m. revealed little to nothing new about the latest Fed think and corroborated the idea that rates are expected to continue to go up and remain up um, for longer than what the market expected. And what does that mean? It means that the Fed is in no rush to cut rates. So the question is, can we get off that horse now? Is there anyone out there that still thinks the Fed is about to pause and then pivot in the late summer or early fall of 2023? Because if you're out there and you think that, I think you have to, honestly, you got to wave the white flag and just give it up and stop thinking it because it's not happening. And to be sure, the Fed Fund Futures Market is telling you just that, right? The rate index that's linked to the June Fed meeting is now reflecting a 5.3% level, which is 75 bips more than where we are right now, which means what? It means that we can expect at least three more 25 basis point moves up. So think March, May, and June. Although there is a 25% probability um, that there's going to be a 50 basis point hike in March, although I, I, I'm not buying that, but there is that probability. And that is on the injury. The futures market is now pricing an eight, a higher peak rate, taking it to 5.5%, up from 4.9%. So I guess we're going to get this mayor cover from Jeffrey Goodluck, no? Remember, he told us to ignore what the Fed was saying, that they didn't know what they were talking about, that Jay Powell didn't know what, the, what he was doing, and that investors needed to pay attention to the bond market, that rates would peak out at 4.9% and be lower by year end. So the question is, how's that working for you? Okay, look, the really funny thing is that investors are paying attention to what the bond market is telling you. And the bond market is saying that we can expect higher rates. And we saw that on Tuesday when the indexes came under pressure as bond prices fell and rates rose, yields rose, right, with the 10-year kissing 4%. The algos went into a tailspin, canceling inline bids, creating a void in demand, while ramping up the sell orders, creating a rise in supply, right? Um, with this year's favorites getting whacked, which makes complete sense, uh, uh, and, and challenging investor psyche, right? It's not that complicated. It's really Econ 101. It's all about demand and supply and what that does to prices both in the short term and the long term. So it all comes back to Econ 101. So if you missed that class in college, you better go back and take it. So yesterday, the back and forth uh, in trading continued to reflect this changing mindset as investors uh, uh, parse the stronger and weaker economic data, right? They parse, uh, they're thinking about the stubborn inflation and parts of the, the economy that matter to you and me. And they're parsing the comments made by, uh, by uh, not one, but all the Fed members about where rates are going. Add in the comments from some of the biggest investment banks that talk their own books, and you've got this ongoing confusion for investors, right? While it wasn't more of the disaster that we saw on Tuesday, it wasn't a resounding vote of confidence either in yesterday's trading. At 4 p.m., the Dow uh, gave up 90 points, the S&P lost 7, the Nasdaq gained 14 points, the Russell added 6, and the transports, the Dow transports also lost 90 points. So it's interesting, the industrials and the transports are both down 90 points. All of this has caused investors to reassess the landscape, and that has led to a steep jump in bond yields, right? Taking the 10-year yield up sharply, going from a low of 3.39% um, in February 
to 3.95% yesterday, right? That's a 17% increase in the yield, right? We saw short duration bonds, the six month and one year pierce a 5% on Tuesday. So do you realize the last time we saw that was in June of 2007 at the start of the great financial crisis when bond yields were plunging, right? When, when financial markets around the world collapsed and then circled the drain by December of 2008, rates on those short duration bonds, or actually all bonds uh, plunged to near zero and then remain there until late 2015, only to surge up to 2.2% on the short duration names before collapsing again when COVID swept across the globe, right? Going back to zero until the start of 22 when JJ drew a line in the sand, right? Uh, con committing to undo the inflation that he and other Fed members were mostly responsible for. And I say mostly because the Bidens didn't help the situation, but that's a whole nother conversation, right? Let's just not go there right now. I mean, do I need to remind you that when the CPI pierced 2% in April of 21, uh, a level that was supposed to signal a change in policy, but somehow it didn't, uh, JJ, along with a parade of other bankers, told us not to worry about it, that they had it. It was a temporary blip. I think the word they used was transitory. All while they continued to stoke the flames, right? Keeping rates at zero until con and continuing to buy mortgage-backed securities to help stabilize the housing market as if the housing market needed stabilization, right? Inflation ran from 1.6% in March of 21 to 9.1% uh, to by July of 22, right? Does that ring a bell? anyone? Did you forget that? So here we are. The gains in the S&P that began in November of 2020 when the S&P was trading at 35.50 ran until January of 2022, topping out at 4,800. That's a 35% gain, right? That all got wiped out in the next 10 months as confusion over monetary policy and fiscal policy weighed on markets and investor psyche. Interest rates went from zero to the current level of four and a quarter, four and a half percent, all while many cried, uncle, begging the Fed to stop the madness. But they didn't, and apparently they're not gonna do that anytime soon, right? And so it's time to reconsider how you invest and how you're gonna put your investment dollars to work in the months ahead. And low quality, sexy names would not be one of the places that I uh, would consider. I think the environment uh, remains antsy, but that doesn't mean that there's not opportunities in the equity market to put money to work, right? It just means that you have to consider remaining maybe a bit more defensive in nature right I'm still in that stuff that people need camp right so big boring yet beautiful US mega cap names that are good DV payers and that grow their dividends consistently are just one place to start and you can find those in almost every sector that's out there you just have to do a little bit of homework right um, and then you can complement that core portfolio with some of the names that uh, have gotten clobbered but remain key to a portfolio to add alpha to uh, to the total portfolio performance, right? So that means, you know, again, doing your homework to identify which names those are. And we and uh, we've seen that so far this year, right? So we've seen a rebound in the semis as from the tech communications consumer discretionary, all have proven to be those complementary names that I'm referring to, right? But don't be chasing anything. You see, uh, because you can see how fast that move can change it and how fast we can see all those same names turn right around um, and get clobbered. So in this case, patience is a virtue. Yesterday, we saw a bit of a rebound, slight as it was, in those sectors that took it on the chin on Tuesday, right? That we saw a rebound in consumer discretion, communications, basic materials. Not big, but they were up while the other sectors were lower. We saw it in housing, we saw it in retail. They all showed slight gains um, as the rest of the market, you know, continued to digest the beating that it took on Tuesday. Oil got punched in the face once again, uh, falling $2.50 to 3.3% to end the day at 73.85. The, uh, the American Petroleum Institute reported that U.S. crude and fuel inventories rose by 9.9 .9 million barrels versus the expected increase of 2.1 million barrels, stoking worries about demand. In addition, the rising dollar isn't helping uh, oil move up at all. In fact, it's putting pressure as the rising dollar puts pressure on all commodities, while analysts remind us that uh, the additional rate cuts by Russia, beyond what they've already promised, coupled with the China reopening, is going to tighten supplies, and that's going to help uh, support prices. This morning, oil is up 65 cents at $74.60, and I suspect 
fact that we can expect to hear from the Saudis any day now as they opine on what they can do and where they want oil prices to be. We're now at the lower end of the recent trading bed where I think it's going to find support once again and move higher, especially once the Saudis you know, threaten to cut production that will force oil right back up to 80. The dollar index uh, remains up, right? Trading at 104.57. That was up 3.7% since early February and likely going higher on the back of what we learned yesterday uh, about where the Fed is going and what the future Fed moves will be. And that's going to continue to be a headwind for oil as well as gold, silver, and other precious metals, right? Uh, as noted, as I already told you uh, uh, earlier, bonds continued. Uh, to sell off sending yields up, right? The 10 year is now kissing 4%, the two year kissing 4.7, the shorter duration three month uh, is kissing 4.8, and the six month bill is piercing 5%. Yesterday saw mortgage apps fall by 13% on top of the 7.7% decline the prior week. 30 year conforming mortgages are now running at 6.6% for someone with a 730, 750 credit score with 20% down and only going up as rates go up. So do not expect a bounce in housing uh, prices, the selling season, which is now underway, right? Get started this time every year. This morning, U.S. futures are attempting to push higher, taking the Fed minutes all in stride. Dow futures up 90, the S&P up 20, the Nasdaq's ahead by 110, the Russell's up 7. Economic data today includes the Chicago Fed survey, right? Expected to be down uh, uh, a quarter of a, a point. The Kansas City Fed survey expected to be down to the second revision of fourth quarter GDP, unchanged at 2.9%. Initial jobless claims of 200,000 uh, up slightly right over last week. Continuing claims of 1.7 million again up slightly over last week. European markets are up about half a percent across the board. They're also taking the Fed minutes in stride. Eurozone CPI came in as expected, so there was no surprise there to move markets one way or the other. The S&P yesterday lost seven points in the day at 39.91 after trading as low as 39.76 and as high as 4,017. I'm still rooting for S&P 4,000 to hold, so it remains a key level to watch. Futures this morning are trying to push higher. So uh, this remains a critical junk juncture, right? I still think that Mikey Wilson is wrong about where uh, stocks are going, right? Down 26% from here. I think that's a bit dramatic. But I do remain in the camp that we will see continued volatility ahead until we get some calming in the uh, economic macro data points. Could we see lower prices next week and the week after? Sure. But I'm not forecasting a hurricane at all the way that Mikey, uh, Mikey Wilson from Morgan Stanley is, right? NVIDIA, a fan favorite, is soaring this morning, up 8%, right? It's being bid $224 a bid. Last night it closed at $204 um, on the back of better earnings, better guidance, and better artificial intelligence mania, positioning themselves smack in the middle of that game, right? Price targets for that stock are now going up by all the big investment banks, naturally post the, post the announcement. Piper Sandler raises it to uh, their, their target to 275. JP Morgan raises it to 250. Needham goes to 270. Expect more uh, investment banks to chime in later today, right? In the end, you know what to do. You need to stick to the plan. Don't chase stocks. Buy them on pullbacks. Complement um, uh, your longs with some downside protection. Doesn't have to be complicated, right? Stay focused on the end game, right? And listen, you can always call me to discuss because I'm always happy to discuss it, especially as I'm sitting here in this gorgeous weather. I mean, oh my God, it is just beautiful. Okay, so what are we have for dinner tonight? We're going to have the herb uh, balsamic marinated pork chops, right? So you begin with this by preheating your oven to 400 degrees after, well, preheat your oven to 400 degrees when you're ready to cook it, right? You're going to start with four uh, to six pork chops on the bone, thin or thick cut, whatever you prefer, right? You just, it's going to depend on the cooking time, depending on how thick they are. You want to rinse and pat them dry, set them aside. Now, in a bowl, you're going to add equal parts of olive oil and balsamic vinegar, so one-to-one -one ratio. Now, out of that bowl, you're going to add a bit of rosemary, thyme, uh, and fresh basil, right? Mix it all together. You're going to season the chops with salt and pepper, and then you're going to marinate them in this, in this oil balsamic sauce for at least an hour, but you can do it over and I put them in a Ziploc bag and you can marinate them overnight if you want most. When you're ready to when you're ready to cook them now heat up your oven, right? Now, you want to place the chops in an oven-proof grill cast iron 
pan uh, that you can go from stove top to the oven. You want to sear the chops on the stove just for two minutes really quick so you get the grill marks and then place the chops in the oven with the marinade, right? You want to cover them tightly and place them in the oven. Cook them for 10 minutes, flip them, then take them out, flip them over, cook them for another 10 minutes. Now, depending on the thickness of that chop is going to determine the time. So maybe it's a little bit more, maybe it's a little bit less, right? Only you know. After that, you're going to remove the cover and turn on the broiler. Broil the chops to create just a bit of a crust on the chop uh, and then repeat, flip it and then repeat, right? Be careful, don't dry them out, don't let them stay there too long and don't put them right up against the boil, uh, broiler, right? If you want to, you can also do this on your grill if you want, but it's just easier in the kitchen just doing that. Serve this dish with uh, roasted mashed potatoes and maybe a green vegetable, something like French cut green beans or something like that, steamed and dressed with a, with a dab of butter and maybe some salt and pepper. And as usual, serve this with a salad of uh, Boston bib uh, and some arugula, some red onions, cucumbers and tomatoes, maybe with a uh, with a with an oil and balsamic vinaigrette or a lemon uh, olive oil dressing that's clean. It's always my favorite. Salt and pepper, a little bit of oregano, always makes it great. In any event, look, it's an absolutely gorgeous day here in, uh, in South Florida. The rest of the country is probably coming under some uh, some bad weather, but it's great here. Until tomorrow, take good care.